uh, endorsement of, of the company's actions uh, in the aftermath uh, by, the, by the PCC. And now, did we rely, did the company rely on those things for too long? Um, I think it's clear that, uh, that the company did. And if I knew then what I know today with respect to the relevant leading council's opinion, um, the details and import of the Four Neville uh, documents, um, the company would have acted differently um, and probably in a way similar to that as which we've acted in the last year to really move as aggressively and determinedly as we can to sort this out and make sure we put it right. But clearly there are people in the company who knew what was going on and were not reporting it to you. So who should have reported these things to you? As I answered the question earlier, um, I believe that if that where where evidence or sufficient suspicion of widespread uh, criminality um, or allegations of it were there, you know, this was the job of the of the of the new editor who had come in to, for lack of a better word, to clean this up. Um, to make me aware of those things. But on the contrary, I was not shown those things in 2008. And in 2009, I received the same assertions around the quality of those investigations and the lack of evidence that this committee received. And that's something that is, um, you know, is a matter of regret. And I think the problem is that you know, were I a shareholder, I'm not a shareholder, but were I in your company, I'd actually expect you to know what was going on. Um, and it begs the question, which do you think is worse? knowing what was going on but being willfully blind to it or not knowing what was going on when you should have known what was going on? I think it's important to put the news of the world in the, in the context of the scale of the overall business and what the company deals with and I deal with on a, on a daily basis. The news of the world was the smallest uh, newspaper um, financially of four in an operating company, uh, News International, um, which was the smallest by some measures of all of the companies uh, within the European and Asian business. This is a company of over 50,000 employees globally. Um, there's an, 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 and appropriately so, senior management in the company, myself included, rely on executives at various levels in the business to behave uh, in a certain way. Um, and we have to rely on those people and we have to trust them to be able to get the job done that they need to do because it's, in, it's otherwise impossible to manage every single detail of the company of this scale. I'm just following on from Mr. Sanders' question. This committee, a committee, the committee of Parliament, produced a report in 2009 in which we said we found it inconceivable that only one person was involved and that we said the company was gu uh, guilty of collective amnesia. Now, do that, uh, it was published, uh, obviously, the evidence of uh, 2009. The result of that was that your papers described this committee, and in particular members of this committee, as a disgrace to Parliament. Wouldn't it be more appropriate when a parliamentary committee reached that conclusion for you to have another internal investigation rather than rubbishing the committee? I think, um, I think as I said before, um, at various times through this process, the company, and, and, I, and I am sorry for this, the company moved, to, um, moved into an aggressive defense um, too quickly, and was, it was too easy for the company to do that with all of the noise and clamor around the business. And I think that particularly with respect to the early 2010 report, a more forensic look at the specific evidence that had been given to this committee in 2009 would have been, uh, would have been something that uh, we could have done. Um, and, you know, and I could have directed the management of the company uh, to do differently. But the, you know, at that time, I had stepped away from day-to-day -day management of News International. But I think in hindsight today, I look back at the reaction to the committee's report and think that would be, a, that would be, that would be one turning point, if you will, that the company could have taken. So you admit it was a mistake not to have taken that report seriously and done something about it? Well, I think, I think what I would say is that the company at the at, 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 at the highest levels, you know, should have been, you know, should have had a good look at the evidence that was given to you in retrospect uh, in 2009, and had a proper look at that in 2010, and followed that trail wherever it led. Tom Watson. Uh, good morning, James. Um, after the arrest of Rebecca Brooks, we were given legal advice uh, and prohibited from going down a certain route without questions. So can you just confirm to me that you've not been arrested or you're not currently on bail 
and you're therefore free to answer all the questions I'm going to put to you. Um, I have not been arrested, and I'm not currently on bail, um, and uh, I am free to answer questions, and I'd like to. Um, I should say, though, that to the extent that questions relate to matters of criminal investigation or relate to individuals that are currently arrested on bail or under criminal investigation, that some of those things would be inappropriate, as you know, for me to answer. I understand that. And you've just said that you, you have now read the committee uh, submissions from Julian Pike and Farrow and Co., as, as well as Tom Crow, and that's right, isn't it? The recent submissions yeah. that came through, yes. Yeah. So I'd like to ask you a series of questions about those documents, for which I'd be grateful for just a yes or no answer. Do you accept that Mr Crone prepared a detailed memorandum concerning the Gordon Taylor case, which he sent to Colin Myler and Mr Pike on the 24th of May 2008? Mr. Crone prepared a memorandum, but it was substantially narrower and did not raise certain things in that memorandum that the leading counsel's opinion raised. And I think that's a critical point to so, note. So that's a yes. He, I sent, think it, he sent it to Crone and Myler. He said, I, I, would, I, would question, I would question your characterization of its detail. Okay, okay. So, so he, but he did send a memorandum. You yes, he did send a memorandum. I think it was on the 24th of May. Uh, and do you accept that the memorandum was prepared by Crone for Mr. Myler in advance of his meeting or discussion with you? Uh, I, I, I don't know that I would assume that that was the case, and certainly some of the things in that memorandum were discussed with me in the, the conversation with Crone and Mr. Myler on the 10th of June. So that's a yes. Do you accept this memorandum acknowledges that documents recently disclosed in the Taylor case evidence widespread criminality at the News of the World and were, in Crone's words, fatal to your case and that your position was very perilous? Mr. Crone did use those words around uh, the evidence being fatal to our case, unquote. But again, in, at no point in that memorandum was it mentioned, uh, Mr. Thorbeck, for example, wider spread criminality with respect to phone hacking. Um, and those crucial details from the leading counsel's opinion had been left out in that memorandum of the 24th. So that's a yes. Do you accept um, that Mr. You Mr. Mr. Watson, sorry, I, don't, I don't think it is. I think you're, 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 you're trying to put words in my mouth. I think the, the, the memorandum was prepared. It did not discuss those ah, crucial oh, elements sorry, of sorry. widespread criminality okay. and certainly didn't mention those individuals involved. Okay. Do you accept that you met Colin Myler on the 27th of May to discuss the Taylor case? You've said that you weren't sure if it was a meeting, but you accept that there was a conversation. No, as I uh, answered Mr. The, chair Mr. the Chairman's question um, earlier on, uh, I'm, uh, I'm aware of the note of a conversation with Mr. Myler. Neither Mr. Myler nor I recall that conversation. A conversation or a telephone call could have happened, but I neither accept nor deny that it occurred. I have no recollection of it. But you said the only point. substantive meeting that occurred on this subject was on June 10th with Mr. Myler and Mr. Crone. But you accept in Mr. Pike's note of the conversation with Myler that Myler believed there was a conversation uh, and that he relayed the message that you wanted to take the view of, ex of an external QC before deciding what action to take. You accept that that document exists? I accept that the document exists, but I don't think it says what you are characterizing it as saying. Uh, Mr. Myler and Mr. Crone had already instructed leading counsel at that point, um, and this is an important point. It was not me who, in, who told them to instruct leading counsel. They had already done that, um, and Mr. Myler, neither Mr. Myler nor I recall that conversation um, or what a conversation was about at that point. But Pike's note is very clear. He's in the, under the impression that you've asked Myler to... Uh, get him to, to instruct him. Mr. Pike's note says that uh, Colin Myler spoke to Colin Myler. Colin Myler said, spoke to James Murdoch, no options, wait for QC's opinion or something of the like. It doesn't at all say that I instructed Mr. Myler to <laughs> seek QC's opinion. But you accept that Michael Silverleaf QC prepared a detailed opinion on the merits of the Taylor case dated the 3rd of June 2008? Uh, yes, he did. I've now seen that opinion. Oh, and do you accept that Mr. Silverleaf's, Silverleaf's opinion stated that there is overwhelming evidence of the involvement of a number of newsgroup newspaper journalists in the illegal inquiries into redacted name? In addition, there is substantial surrounding material about the extent of NGN journalist attempts to obtain access to information mm -hmm. illegally in relation to other individuals. In the light of these facts, there is a powerful case that there is a culture of illegal information access used at NGN in order to produce stories for publication. I don't have that exact quotation in front of me. Mr. Silverleaf did provide 
an opinion. It was not shown to me at the time, nor was it discussed with me in those terms at any, in any way. I have since seen it, and yes, it concludes that, there, that, there's, that there's sufficient evidence to suggest that there's wider spread activity in illegal voicemail intercepts. And so you accept that following the receipt of this opinion, you again met with Mr. Myler, this time with Mr. Crone on the 10th of June, to discuss the Gordon Taylor case, and following that meeting, Mr. Crone called Mr. Pike to report on your discussions. Um, as I've testified to this committee in the past, and I've written to this committee in some detail on this matter, it's the only substantive meeting that I recall occurred on the 10th of June. That is the case. It was with Mr. Crone and Mr. Myler, and it was to discuss uh, the case, but it was in order to for them to receive authority to increase the settlement offers that they had already made. Um, and, then, and after that meeting, Crone called Pike. You accept that? Uh, that seems to be the, what's, 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 what's in, the, in the documents provided to you. Do you accept that Mr. Pike's note of his conversation with Crone on the 10th of June 2008 states that JM, presumably you, said he wanted to think through the options? Yes, I've seen that. I've seen that note, uh, and I don't recall... I recall leaving that meeting with a clear understanding that they would increase their offer. Whether or not there was some, some time to rest on it for a minute, I, I, I don't recall that part of the conversation. Do you accept that Crone and Myler have not had access to their office files since they left the company's employment? It's my understanding that they have not had access to those files, although... Do you accept that Crone states in his letter to us of the 5th of November 2011 that he believes that you had knowledge of the, of, of the widespread criminality identified in his memorandum, that's my view, of the 24th of May 2008, and subsequently confirmed in Mr Silverleaf's opinion of the 3rd of June 2008, and that you had this from at least the 27th of, 27th of May 2008, when you met Myler to discuss Mr Crone's memorandum of the 24th. Of no, May. I don't accept that at all, Mr Watson. I was given at the 10th of June meeting sufficient information to authorise the increase of settlement offers that Mr. Crone and Mr. Myler had already made. Neither Mr. Myler nor I remember a conversation on the 27th of May, uh, and the Mr. Silverleaf's opinion uh, was not shown to me or discussed in that, in that context, nor was any evidence of wider spread phone hacking, nor any reason to carry out any further investigations was shown to me or discussed with me at that time. And that's what I've testified to consistently to this committee in person and in writing over the last number of months. This committee, you failed to inform this committee of the 27th of May meeting or discussion. Uh, Mr. Myler uh, 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 might not have recollection of it, but the lawyer does, the external lawyer. Isn't it inconceivable that throughout this two-week period you didn't at any stage discuss with either, Cr either Crone's memorandum Silverleaf's opinion or the Four Neville email, given that these were the three documents that were forcing you to settle the claim, a claim that you were previously defending and, ma and making an unprecedented payment to Taylor in order to buy his silence. As I've testified to you, and I think Mr. Crone and Mr. Myler have testified to you as well, none of those documents were given to me or shown to me at the 10th of June meeting or previously. Neither Mr. Myler or I recall the 27th of May alleged conversation um, and seeing as, you know, and, and we might have had a telephone call. It was not substantive because otherwise one of us might have remembered it. Um, and I've testified to you very consistently about my knowledge of evidence or suspicion of wider sped phone hacking, uh, and, uh, and, that's, and, that's, and, 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 and that's what happened. The period between those days uh, was one um, where I wasn't in London, actually. Um, the week before uh, the 10th of June meeting, I was in India uh, at our television business there, and then at Hong Kong uh, after that, and I only returned late in the afternoon on the 10th um, from other business in the UK not related to News International. Mr. Murdoch, let me just ask you again. Did you mislead this committee in your original testimony? No, I did not. So if you didn't, who did? As I've said to, as I've written to you, and I've said publicly, um, I believe this committee um, was given evidence by individuals either without full possession of the facts, or now it appears um, in the process of my own discovery and trying to understand as best I can what actually happened here. Um, it was economical. I think. Um, my own testimony has been consistent. I've testified to this committee with 
as much clarity and transparency as I possibly can. And where I haven't 